So after, after the, uh, the really excellent ex uh, introduction we had uh, uh, to uh, this, this field of um, prostate imaging this morning from you know, one of the great pioneers in the area, uh, John Babbage, and some, some really exciting new data from Louise Emmett, so we're going to move into uh, talking about uh, how this applies uh, clinically, and it's really a great pleasure for me to share the, 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 the chairing of this session uh, with someone whose name you've heard uh, a number of times during the meeting, uh, being involved in the development of uh, P PSMA, uh, both for imaging and for therapy, Klaus Kopke from uh, University of Heidelberg, who worked very closely with UVA Habercorn and the other pioneers of uh, PSMA imaging at that great institution. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, also uh, introduce to you the first speaker in this session, uh, who is Declan Murphy, Associate Professor Declan Murphy, who's the chair of our uh, GU uh, Oncology Unit at the, uh, the Peter Mac. Uh, uh, he's uh, not only a, a very good surgeon, he's also an awfully nice guy. Uh, and that's probably the best uh, <laughs> thing you can say about a, a surgeon these days, I think. <laughs> that's the nicest thing you've ever said about me. Thank you very much. <laughs> What do you want? Um, and thank you once again, um, uh, Rod, uh, Dr. Kopke, uh, Michael, for inviting me to speak about this. As I mentioned, we are now being uh, inundated with uh, interest in this area. So um, uh, over the next few minutes, I thought I'd share some clinical perspectives uh, from a urologist working full-time in prostate cancer. And the title I was uh, given was, as you see here, should PSMA PET replace uh, conventional imaging? And I can tell you honestly around here, uh, as Louise hinted at, the answer is it already has pretty much. And the challenge is we have all this imaging, all these results coming in, and no data really to guide the uh, management impact, and, and that's the challenge uh, going forward. Uh, I have no relevant disclosures, and I would like to acknowledge all the uh, fantastic uh, GU Oncology multidisciplinary uh, team uh, we work with uh, at Peter Mac uh, and uh, uh, over in Richmond, where a lot of our private patients are uh, in Australia. Half the patients are insured, and 75% uh, of prostate cancers are in the private sector. So it's very important for us to uh, partner with our uh, uh, um, uh, providers in the private sector as well to, so that we can uh, really work through the volume of uh, results we're getting through. So let me start with this extremely familiar tale. Uh, this is a patient, 61-year-old, uh, uh, with localized prostate cancer. Um, he has an initial MRI, and you can see a nice lesion here. Uh, he's got uh, radical prostatectomy showing some T3 disease, as you see here. His PSA becomes undetectable, uh, and he's watched carefully, and his PSA slowly rises, and he opts for salvage radiotherapy. The PSA goes down a bit, and then the PSA goes up a bit. And here you are, uh, two and a half years out. Uh, the patient has biochemical recurrence after surgery and radiotherapy. For what it's worth, he has conventional imaging, which are normal, and what do you do now? And this situation happens to about 30%, 30% of the radical prostatectomies uh, we put through our system, and it happens probably to a higher proportion of patients undergoing radiotherapy, but it's usually a couple of years later because um, uh, the PSA is less valuable after uh, radiotherapy than after surgery. So we've written a little bit about this, as uh, John hinted earlier, about the interest in oligometastatic disease uh, because of improved imaging in recent years. And I suppose the premise for oligometastatic disease interest is that if we can identify all the disease, and if we can ablate or resect all that disease, could we potentially cure some of these patients? Um, or could we at least postpone the requirement for systemic therapy? And that is the backdrop to interest in oligometastatic disease. But of course, it's just a function of imaging sensitivity. The very definition is highly dependent on how good the imaging is. And the imaging, of course, has not been very good. That, that's the problem. And therefore, if you think you're identifying all the disease and you think you're ablating all the disease based on poor quality imaging, well, you're going to have poor outcomes. And we describe this as a, an oligometastatic craze that's been happening uh, around the world in the, in the past five years. Oligomet mania, uh, I call it. Um, and this is my quick PubMed search before this talk on the number of publications on oligometastatic disease and prostate cancer. And you can see it's just ramping up a huge number of publications coming out reporting experience or, uh, and, and summaries of uh, this type of um, uh, management paradigm. And it reminds me a little bit of uh, Pokemon, of course. Now, you can be honest with me here. It's an honest session. Hands up who downloaded the Pokemon Go app when it came out in June this year. 
Ah, oh, there they are. Look at these. They are. You're more honest than other audiences I speak to. So that, that's very encouraging. And this, of course, uh, created a huge sensation around the world when it was launched in July this year. It was quite remarkable. Hundreds of millions of downloads of this um, uh, game uh, in the first couple of weeks when it came out. And it was unique, of course, because it combined location-based services on your smartphone with augmented reality. You could, uh, you could oversee the, um, the, the sort of Pokemons popping up in front of you uh, and then go and try and chase them. And um, all these apps came out and uh, people were bumping into each other. And um, here's a nice scene in uh, Central Park when uh, a bunch of people spotted some sort of rare Pokemon and they just abandoned uh, their cars and headed into Central Park at midnight to find this Zaffiron or some sort of rare Pokemon. This is about two weeks after the thing came out and, and really the world went a little bit uh, unhinged, a bit crazy those few weeks. Now I'll come back to that in a moment. There's a, there's a reason why I showed that. So back to uh, a biochemical recurrence. So this uh, is a slide from, um, from my friend uh, Jelle Berens. I'm sure some of you know him, uh, an MRI pioneer from uh, uh, the Netherlands. And Yele tells us that that thing I've circled there on the screen is a positive node. Um, he is convinced that that is the site of recurrence in this patient uh, post-prostatectomy. Uh, but for the rest of us, this just looks like a lump. And uh, Rod Hicks loves this uh, topic, and he's written, he's used the, the term lumpology. Many of you have heard him speak about it, I'm sure, uh, for years. And he wrote about it recently with Michael in the context of neuroendocrine tumors. But I really like this idea that what we've been focusing on with oligometastatic disease is lumpology, as Rod says. And the problem is, even with better cross-sectional imaging, we still don't characterize these lumps well. And Yele might be convinced that that's biochemical recurrence, and even that's the only side of biochemical recurrence. But for the rest of us, we just don't believe that, and we definitely need help, which is where uh, PSMA PET imaging came in. So I'm clearly not going to show you all the data on this, but I will highlight uh, this nice paper um, from uh, Tobias Maurer and Matthias and co published in Nature Reviews Urology. And these papers are now coming in urology journals, which is very important and tells you uh, why we're interested. And in this, they just briefly summarize some of the, the key value uh, of PET imaging and prostate cancer management, adding in that molecular information to the anatomical information we've been familiar with, uh, and potentially in, in therapy planning as you see highlighted um, at the bottom here. And we've recently written about this in another urology journal, um, joining with uh, Stefano Fanti and uh, Josh Marigi. Uh, and we even uh, go as far as to say as we think this is evolving as a, a potential new gold standard for imaging in prostate cancer. Um, uh, contentious enough and early enough as it is to say that that's, uh, that's a sense of the enthusiasm we have uh, embracing PSMA PET imaging, bearing in mind we've pretty much ignored uh, choline PET in the world of urology for very many uh, years. Uh, but we do, uh, we do warn in this uh, other paper that Rod uh, recently led that despite this great enthusiasm and this very rapid adoption, which I'll come back to, we really need to, to do better studies to define the role. Uh, and I'll speak about this in a moment uh, when I talk about the, the clinical impact in our practices. Um, so this is a, another graph showing the publications of PSMA PET and prostate cancer just up to this month, and it'll get even, even higher. So again, this is sort of uh, paralleled, isn't it, with the uh, oligometastatic uh, craze. Uh, so I think the, the PSMA PET craze is going to drive the oligometastatic craze, and they're going to feed off each other like a bunch of rabbit uh, animals. Um, because if everyone's having a PET scan for their biochemical recurrence at a PSA of 0.4, yes, Louise is going to find all these lumps. But what are we going to do with them? Do they all need to be treated? How are we going to treat them? Should we treat them, etc.? cetera? Um, and I think this is a, a huge circle of activity that's, um, uh, that's, got, that's being generated by PSMA PET imaging. And we welcome a lot of this, of course. Um, but as John Babbage pointed out, this is a potential gold mine for everybody because of the volume of A, prostate cancer, and B, uh, prostate cancer recurrence following definitive treatment. And this is the so-called plague that we've just written about uh, in the BJUI. And uh, this is an editorial we wrote on uh, Louise's, uh, one of Louise's papers that she's just shown you. And we describe this as a plague in some countries, particularly Australia and Germany. And to give you some idea, flashback two years ago when Peter Mack uh, was the only center in Melbourne providing PSMA PET imaging. Uh, these scans are not funded in Australia, so patients are uh, typically paying about US uh, $900 at that time. And at one point, as within a few months, really, of the service starting, um, Peter Mack was getting up to 12 requests per day, I think Rod told me one day, and, and the wait, oh. 
So my computer has been a bit sick. Uh, Dino, you might have to uh, rescue me. Um, I upset this computer on a flight recently, and, um, and I've had to order a, a new one. But um, we have the other slides loaded as a backup on the PC. Um, thank you very much. I'll go forward from here. It does mean we lose the videos, I'm afraid, but um, that's OK. Um, so um, uh, it, it does mean that, uh, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, what we have now, fast forward two years in a city with, uh, with uh, less than um, five million people uh, population, we have uh, eight or nine uh, providers in the city or just outside the city uh, providing PSMA PET imaging. The price has dropped because of all the private players in the, in the market trying to suck in all the general prostate imaging, especially MRI. So the, it's now about 550 US dollars uh, for a scan. Uh, which is very absorbable, I can tell you, in the prostate cancer population in Australia. And you can pretty much get a scan done the same day. And what that means, as we've written about in this editorial, is we have hundreds and hundreds of these scans coming through the door every month uh, in Australia, and we really don't know what to do with the results. So I'll give you some clinical perspectives on uh, three different patient situations, of which the most common, as you know already, is biochemical recurrence. Here's a patient of mine. Uh, he had a high PSA at presentation. It was about 60, had a radical prostatectomy. His PSA never went away, so he always had disease outside the prostate. And at the time of this scan, his PSA was 24, so a very high PSA. But he was still M0 on conventional imaging, which included at that time choline uh, PET imaging at Peter Mac. Uh, and on his first PSMA PET scan, we found uh, lots of small retroperitoneal nodes, all less than five millimeters, so not apparent on conventional imaging and not apparent on choline. And then he had this seven millimeter left supraclavicular lymph node, which we biopsied uh, and found uh, at least an eight uh, prostate cancer. But we never would have found that node before. We never checked the left supraclavicular fossa. And it's amazing to me how many patients have disease uh, in that area, even at relatively low PSAs, even in the primary um, setting. Um, so his situation became very apparent, and uh, uh, he went on, had androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, here's another chap, previous surgery, uh, T3 disease, as you can see here. Uh, his PSA was 9 initially, but he was really straightforward. Prostate cancer, node negative, margin negative. You would expect he would have a good biochemical result, but his post-op PSA was very high at 7.1. And this is an unusual situation, but we see one of these about every two months because of the volume of prostate cancer we do. For what it's worth, conventional imaging negative, but a PSMA PET scan reveals uh, the true extent of disease uh, throughout the rib cage and even here in the ileum, again, negative on conventional uh, imaging. One shot scan gives us all the information. Another chap, a previous open surgery, previous radiation, PSA now 0 0.9, and he had a CT of the abdomen and pelvis and a bone scan elsewhere, which was negative, and then got sent down for a PSMA PET scan, and lo and behold, he's got uh, a couple of lesions in his lung, which are actually apparent on conventional imaging, but we don't normally do a CT of the chest uh, in men in this situation. We certainly do now because we see a lot of lung lesions. And again, he, we've biopsied and resected a lot of these lesions over the past couple of years, and we, we know this is, this is right, this is, this is prostate cancer. And post-radiation is another area that I think there's real value in, in this, uh, uh, this type of scan. So a typical example, 61-year-old uh, underwent uh, LDR, low dose rate brachytherapy for a fairly straightforward prostate cancer just two years ago. But his PSA remained a little bit high at 3.9, and um, uh, his radiation oncologist was a little bit anxious about this. So he had a, an MR. We use a lot of MR in this country as well. We can see the seeds here, typical uh, loss of intensity post-LDR. But we can see here we got uh, restricted diffusion on the ADC map here anteriorly, uh, and likewise we got focal contrast enhancement. Uh, and his PSMA, oh, these videos probably won't play now, disappointingly. Um, but his PSMA PET scan, uh, again, um, it correlates very nicely with what we saw on the MRI, and importantly for us, doesn't show any disease outside the prostate. And here what we see very typically is the seed distribution here and a relatively cold spot where there's been a, a, a under uh, implantation of the prostate and a big hot area. We always go on and biopsy these, but, uh, and this turned out to be uh, prostate cancer. He had a salvage prostatectomy. This is the final pathology, again mapping very nicely to the MR and the PSMA PET, uh, and a large fleshy tumor here away from all these seeds. So what we now do is PSMA PET as a first line scan instead of an MRI because we get the whole body information. And as Louise in her study pointed out, we will see distant disease in about 10% of these patients. 
Uh, Louise has already highlighted our meta-analysis, and we published this in European Urology, which is the biggest urology journal and um, with a high impact factor. And again, it's because of the, uh, the interest in, in uh, PSMA PET imaging in the urology community that um, European Urology are interested uh, in this topic, which I'll skip by. So my take-home messages on recurrence for us as urologists, it looks very promising, even at very low PSA levels. That's the real value. The specificity is high, the sensitivity is very good, really, um, depending on the PSA level. However, we certainly need better comparisons with conventional imaging, which is uh, Michael's pro-PSMA study, which he'll talk about later. Uh, we still need some more tissue validation, although it's like, you know, we, know, we know that this is going to be right 95 96% of the time. I suppose an area that we've learned lessons on is these uh, not terribly avid rib lesions. Uh, we're less convinced by them, uh, and there have been some rib biopsies and rib resections done showing that these are often uh, false positive, and they're not really positive probably when we go back and look at them. So what about primary staging? That's another great area of interest. So here's a 68-year-old on active surveillance. Now his PSA is very high for active surveillance. We do a lot of active surveillance in our center. We have just published a series of almost 1,000 patients on surveillance. But PSA of 42 is a bit high for surveillance. He'd had negative biopsies before. On his MRI, all we saw was a PIRADS-3 lesion. Um, and he had a targeted biopsy of that lesion. And all we found was Gleason grade group 1, which is Gleason 6 in, in, old, in the old terms, in this area, and nothing else. So very low volume disease, suitable for surveillance. And he went on surveillance. He's a, he's a doctor. He's a colleague. But his PSA still continued to climb and got to 46, and he got a bit twitchy. So we did a PSMA PET scan. Uh, and on his PSMA PET scan, we see a very significant amount of activity uh, on that side where the biopsy was positive but only showed low-grade disease. And based on that, he decided to have a radical prostatectomy. And what we see on his radical prostatectomy is very significant reclassification to uh, Gleason grade group 3, which is Gleason 4 plus 3 uh, in old terms. And it's very nicely highlighted on his PET scan. So can, as was spoken about earlier, PSMA PET imaging have a role in stratifying these patients with localized prostate cancer? I think the answer is probably yes, although I would say we still don't always see this nice picture. We will see patients, I'll show you an example, with high-grade, high poorly differentiated disease with little expression uh, of PSMA, and conversely, we will see low-grade cancer with high expression. It can be a little bit heterogeneous. It's not quite as linear as we, we would like to think. And Louise has already covered this nicely and shown uh, uh, the Munich paper from Tobias and uh, Mat uh, Matthias. Um, so what I'll, I'll make a comment about this saying that I think this clearly has value. And therefore, if we have patients who we think are at higher risk of lymph node metastases, and if they can afford uh, the money for a PSMA PET scan, we will offer them a scan if it helps us guide the lymph node dissection. But that's exactly the sort of uh, patient that will be in the prospective randomized study that Michael will uh, speak about later on today. So it's fine to say we do it ad hoc because we do all the time. Uh, but we definitely need a, a better a randomized study comparing this with conventional imaging and measuring the decision impact, which is what this uh, very nice study uh, um, uh, uh, will uh, uh, develop for us. And that's, uh, this men was mentioned earlier, but we do see these patients. Uh, here's a 59-year-old PSA 5, uh, clinically T3 patient of mine. And what you see here is this very large, significant um, PIRADS 3 lesion with restricted diffusion here, clinically T3, fit guy otherwise. Uh, biopsy him at least in grade group 5 everywhere, which is basically at least in 9 cancer everywhere. Um, his bone scan and, and conventional CT showed no evidence of bone disease, but on his CT he had multiple lung metastases and he did have some pelvic lymph nodes. So the question for us was, well, what are these lung metastases? Uh, what's the nature of these? And um, uh, so we did a PSMA PET scan, which was negative. And then he went on and had a VATS lobectomy showing Gleason 5 prostate cancer up there. So he wasn't expressing his PSMA either in the primary or here, uh, for example, but he did have lung metastases. This is important for us because we will offer these patients different types of systemic therapy in the knowledge that they do have lung metastases. So do we need to do a, a, a biopsy in the PSMA AVID patients? Probably not. We, we believe it now. But what does this mean? And this is another, un unfortunately, common situation. This is uh, uh, from a patient of ours where uh, we, we have in BJUI forthcoming. These mesorectal nodes, and this is a, a reasonably large one, um, but these things we see quite frequently in patients with primary staging issues. And I'm sure in Michael's study we're going to see a bunch of these. And these do not fall in the template for extended pelvic lymph node dissection in prostate cancer. 
Uh, that template goes up the internal iliacs, external iliacs, obturator is up to common iliacs, but they, we don't go down into this mesorectal area. And it's a reminder of why extended node dissection or nodal radiotherapy doesn't always work for these patients because there's an alternate drainage pathway which comes down the middle rectal, we see these, are, these veins all the time doing a prostatectomy, and land in this zone and come up presacral, retrocrural, left supraclavicular. Uh, and we never really recognize this, and now PSMA PET imaging is showing it to us uh, all the time. Big shift, big paradigm shift. So regarding primary staging, my take-home message is uh, undoubtedly we're seeing that many high-risk localized prostate cancers on conventional imaging are being conver converted from N0, M0 into N1, M1. And therefore, we need to better assess how we manage that information, what impact it has on the decision. Should a fit 52-year-old with negative imaging but a positive lymph node presacral uh, be denied surgery or radiation when we obviously would have offered that before and many of these patients benefit in a multimodal fashion? Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But the problem is, uh, with the plague of PSMA PET imaging, these results are coming in the door every day of the week. Literally today, I've seen a couple already. So that's all about the imaging and the staging. But of course, as this meeting is all about theranostics, and um, before you go into the sort of systemic uh, um, uh, arena that many of you are so experienced in and have published so widely on, uh, the other nice aspect about this is PSMA-guided surgery. And Louise highlighted a case earlier of a patient who had a, a, a node dissection that uh, missed uh, a, a PSMA PET scan that missed small volume nodes. Yes, we know they are there. Um, but also, we will miss some of these nodes doing an extended node dissection uh, because they can be very tiny, tucked away in far corners, etc. Um, and myself and Nathan Lorenchuk here visited um, uh, Tobias, who's here on the left, uh, and his boss uh, in uh, Munich recently, and visited Matthias uh, as well. And we wanted to see how they do PSMA-guided radiosurgery, so uh, lymph node dissection. And they've published uh, the initial experience of this uh, in European Urology. It's an open surgical approach for patients with PSMA-avid lymph node disease, usually in the recurrent setting and then using an indium-labeled uh, PSMA uh, ligand, which is injected, and then a combination of a, an optical and, a, and a, 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 an acoustic probe. Uh, they've done a very nice series of small patients uh, to guide where these hidden little lymph nodes are, and they've shown that using this, you'll pick up the two-millimeter nodes that otherwise would have been missed. Uh, and I won't, we don't have those videos, but I can tell you that uh, just on Sunday, because I was handling this, I'm an editor at BJUI, um, their follow-up paper, um, the clinical outcomes paper, not just the technique description, the clinical outcomes paper um, has just been accepted uh, in the BJUI describing their experience of 31 patients. And I'll just give you their conclusion that um, this approach, this uh, radio -guided, uh, radio, PSMA-guided radio surgery, uh, is high value for intraoperative detection of even very small lesions and allows very exact localization and resection. So, you know, this is an interesting area and it's where the value of PET imaging is now moving forward into targeted uh, treatment, whether that's a node dissection or, or other aspects. I'm not going to speak about this because many experts here will be speaking about this. Uh, safe to say that this is a very exciting area for us. It's one of the reasons we're very interested uh, in this type of Congress. But back to the Pokemon, because you know, the catch phrase for that was got to catch them all. And, you know, you spend your time walking around uh, parks and cities. And I, I know some of you people who put your hands up have been going up and down South Bank looking for uh, Australian Pokemons now that you've been here. And you're trying to build up your collection of all these little creatures uh, as you go along and, uh, and see uh, uh, can you complete your, your challenges. But I think we could call this approach to um, oligometastatic disease Pokemet. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a thing about this for the BJUI shortly, and, and some of us will be uh, co-authoring it. Uh, it's the same sort of thing. If you see these little dots on a PSMA PET scan, like here, you know, you think, oh, here's the thing. What are we going to do with that? Well, in the old days, we wouldn't have found it, and we wouldn't have cared. Now we will either take it out with surgery um, or offer some stereotactic radiation for it. Why not? You know, we can see it. But then, of course, the other one is going to pop up here, and then the other one's going to pop up here, and this one here, and then, of course, one will pop up back down here where you already thought you treated that area. And this, I can tell you, is daily activity uh, uh, working in prostate cancer in Australia today. We see this all the time. Uh, and we've gone crazy trying to catch them all, actually. And then I look at this Congress and I see, you're actually encouraging us to do this sort of stuff, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I think this is, you know, you guys, uh, I don't know. So I know you don't mean it exactly like that, but when I read this, I went, wow, this is exactly what we see with Pokemet uh, in Australia. 
And I would say, yes, if you can see it in prostate cancer in particular, you can treat it. But should we is a question uh, that we haven't properly uh, answered. And we have to challenge ourselves by asking us, should we uh, treat all these little lesions we see in prostate cancer? Finally, just a few comments about managing uh, oligometastatic disease. And here are the sort of uh, management options that we would traditionally be wait, uh, thinking about with oligometastatic disease in a protocol, of course. Uh, here's a patient of ours, previous surgery and radiotherapy, biochemical recurrence, his PSA is 1.2. Uh, he's got sites of disease here in the common iliac and external iliac nodes, and he underwent stereotactic radiation as part of a protocol, and now his PSA is 0.4. And he's happy, and the radiation oncologists uh, are happy as well. But does it really matter? Um, because lots of patients have biochemical recurrence, and we have very good data from Johns Hopkins in particular with 13-year follow-up showing that lots of these will just sit there and really not cause much mischief as years go by. And it's far from clear which of these lesions or which successes like this we should be uh, celebrating, because it's not really clear at all whether this will work. And I can tell you this patient had a further recurrence up here and then uh, went on and had more radiation for his other recurrence. Here's another one, 61-year-old uh, T3 prostate cancer, post-op PSA 0.12. Now, this patient is exactly in the salvage radiotherapy uh, sphere. Uh, and as Louise pointed out in this really nice paper, which is getting a lot of citations, I can tell you we've cited it a few times already. So T3 disease, even though there isn't a positive margin, PSA 0.1, we give those patients the benefit of the doubt and they get offered salvage radiotherapy. And do we do any imaging? Well, for what it's worth, you can do imaging, but it rarely shows anything, conventional imaging. We usually do an MR. Um, and this patient was enrolled in a, in a study in one of the private centers, which takes patients with biochemical recurrence in this, in this area being considered for salvage radiotherapy. And on the PSMA PET, lots of uh, retroperitoneal nodes. And now the question is, well, should that patient still have radiation to the bed, as Louise pointed out in some of those great questions she posed at the end, uh, or should he have radiation to here and here, or should he just have systemic therapy? Uh, and I don't know is the answer, uh, but we do need better studies to help guide these, uh, these inevitable findings we see every day. Salvage node dissection is the other option I mentioned in my list, and there's been a lot of renewed enthusiasm for this uh, in the PSMA PET era as well, and we've got very keen on this as well. Um, a lot of it was triggered by this uh, nice paper from Milan, uh, Milano, Maria Piccio, uh, who leads the Nuke Med program at San Rafael, and some very good urologists, Broganti and Montorzi, uh, and they've reported uh, this series over a few years based on choline PET imaging, 59 patients. They get plenty of complications, I can tell you, having an extended salvage node dissection. Um, and what do we see in terms of outcomes? Well, we see a lot of uh, uh, initial responses, but we also see a lot of recurrences uh, once you follow these patients up for a couple of years. And here are the Kaplan-Meier curves. There are a couple of messages in this. The, the patients who do best are those who only have pelvic disease. They don't have disease above the pelvic brim. Uh, and they don't, they, their PSA level is below uh, four. And that's what most of us sort of take as the best approach to these patients nowadays in the PSMA PET era. I won't be able to show you that video, but we, we presented a series of 20 of these patients at the uh, EAU in Munich this year, uh, showing our surgical approach to salvage node dissection. Uh, the key message there was this is quite difficult and quite sticky. We're you know, in and out of the uh, external iliac vein all the time. Um, but uh, no major complications, otherwise just slightly difficult surgery. But the second point is, it rarely seemed to work uh, in our series. And we set the cut point as PSA less than uh, 0 0.01, you know, undetectable, and only one out of 20 patients actually achieved that endpoint. 90% had a drop in the PSA, but it's like the other case. Should we celebrate that win, or does it make any difference at all to these patients? So I can tell you the enthusiasm for uh, salvage node dissection and stereotactic radiation uh, driven by the PSMA era, has tempered a little bit as we begin to measure some of the successes. And there's been a systematic review of what we call metastasis-directed therapy, M MDT, which is effectively oligometastatic uh, disease. So if you see metastases and you direct ablative or resectative therapy at them, what are the outcomes? And this is a, uh, a study from Euro in European urology recently. Again, relatively small data. But again, you know, uh, once you follow these patients for a little, little while, you see um, a lot of failures in them and uh, a lot of complications, um, uh, whether it's radiation or especially surgery. Um, I'll skip that. And what finally do the guidelines say about this? And the EAU guidelines are very good in this matter. They're now joined with the uh, radiation, uh, the ESTRO guidelines, and the ESMO guidelines from next year. And we basically describe this as experimental. Um, if you're going to have a patient who has oligometastatic disease, uh, especially in the modern era with 
uh, oligometmania, um, you must consider that it's experimental to be offering um, uh, ablative approaches to that type of disease and should only be done in the context uh, of a protocol. So I think that's, that's very important and I have to say that's not always what happens. So in conclusion, I think finally, PET imaging has certainly come of age in prostate cancer, and we never would have said this uh, two years ago before uh, PSMA PET came along. It has come of age, but how exactly it fits, uh, we're, we're still not clear. And for sure, uh, the availability uh, uh, of gallium-labeled PSMA has really triggered this, but it's very exciting to hear uh, of the better ligands, especially fluorinated PSMA, uh, which will be coming, and, and, uh, and that's very important for us as well. But it's the studies that really matter, and especially the management impact studies, because how do we deal now with this, uh, this tsunami, as someone described with this plague, as we describe it, of PSMA PET imaging in Australia, Germany, some other countries, Belgium, um, uh, uh, without the data to guide the decisions? And uh, that's a big challenge for us. And of course, we are very excited to see uh, what you can offer us in terms of uh, theranostic possibilities. And we've been very, very excited with the uh, initial patients in the phase two study uh, at Peter Mac as well. Absolutely um, sensational. And finally, I think for oligometastatic disease, it's very important that we recognize this is not just a, 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 a stable state. It's often an evolving state for some patients. There will be some who are truly oligometastatic and stable, but others it's just a snapshot as a disease is progressing and popping up uh, elsewhere. Uh, and therefore, we should consider that uh, therapy based on this type of nice imaging we see at this meeting, uh, uh, based on this imaging, should be, is an experimental approach. Um, once again, Rod, thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks very much, uh, Declan. Um, quite a few people have asked me what this is. This is the Baum Bad Burka Ball. Uh, no one knows what it really means, but I think it looks a bit like a brain. Uh, rather cortical, and uh, the oxymoron of a thinking surgeon is, is, is a wonderful thing to have, and, and, and we, should always, we should always be engaging with our clinical colleagues, and, and uh, I have what I call my Trojan Horse Club, who, who've all written articles about uh, nuclear medicine imaging and therapy in their own journals, and I'd encourage you all to engage your own Trojan Horse Clubs to, to sell the message, and also to pull us back from over-enthusiasm about finding lumps uh, and, and, and knowing what to do with them is really important, I think. Um, any questions uh, for Declan? Uh, you don't get an opportunity to talk to a, a cognitive surgeon all that often. Please take it. Uh, may, I, may I ask a simpler question first? Uh, in this um, uh, metastasis-directed therapy guidelines, can you remind me on this reference 577? Oh, is that you? <laughs> no <laughs> kidding. <laughs> oh, yes. No. Um, another question. Um, might it be worth to, to go for combining the radio guided surgery with fluorescence guided surgery yes. with robot systems? Yes, so exactly. This, this is a big discussion. Can we avoid radio guided surgery? Can we combine non invasive PET imaging with only fluorescence guided? Yes, really good point. Sorry. And the opportunity with sentinel node uh, type of uh, dissection using fluorescence uh, is very interesting. And, and because nearly all these cases nowadays get done with the robot, um, it is really nicely set up for fluorescence guided imaging. It's got a, a system called Firefly, which is based on ICG. Um, and the group in, um, at NKI in Amsterdam, led by Enk van der Poel, um, has had long had an interest in fluorescence guided node dissection. And now their work is all based on uh, PSMA uh, directed uh, imaging. And they're working on the probes to fit down the eight millimeter uh, ports, but I'm sure that's where we'll go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Th thanks, Declan.